So I'm from the Maloney Institute and I'm going to talk about landscape rehydration, just a few basic things about it. So, um, so that's the Trophina Creek, which is not too far away, I guess. You can see very high energy um, in flow. Um, next slide. And you can, um, so water is, so what, what we're talking about is uh, restoring the water cycle. Um, and the water cycle is actually driven by heaps and heaps of so solar energy hitting the ground and gravity. Um, and that we use vegetation to try and disperse that energy and the water is part of that process as well. But in the same thing, water is actually one of the most, well, is the most erosive force in nature that we have to work against and it's working against the soil and the rock that we're actually on, our, on the land. So I'm not going to go into this too much detail because Tim's already covered some of it. Um, so we have some flow energy equations and it's related to velocity, depth, slope and surface roughness. Tim's already covered what happens when we increase velocity but also if we increase depth, if we um, increase the slope which again re increases velocity or if we reduce the surface roughness, we increase the energy of flow. I'd like to add, let's just go back on the bottom of that one, the surface roughness can vary depending on the depth of flow. So if you've got a, a, a low flow, which is the height of vegetation, that's actually equivalent to high roughness. But if you have a very big flow over that same vegetation, it's actually a low roughness. And we can actually work with that by changing the width of flow and reducing the depth. Next one. So what are the aims of landscape rehydration? Um, so it's basically to support the restoration and the building of soils. We try and increase the longevity of green growth or preferably uh, increase perennial growth, perennial vegetation. And that vegetation provides those things up there. So roots that host microbes, and they facilitate nutrients to the plants. We try and build organic matter, they build organic matter through leaf drop and they all, that also feeds those microbes and helps increase the moisture retention in the soil. We increase, it increases the precipitation through dew um, and moderates extremes of temperature and dissipates solar energy as I mentioned before. And, and the lastly, provides shelter to the soil and reduces evaporation and erosion, both wind and water. So what we're going to try and do, slow the flow. So we can do that by um, diversion, we lengthen the flow path as Tim was talking about, and we can spread the flow, which reduces the depth and increases the width. And what we're aiming to do is just reduce those peaks into much lower and lengthen that flow hydraf out, as shown by those two diagrams. Next one. So what are the tools? Direct perennial vegetation. Um, if we can plant appropriate species um, and they can also just directly into places, they can also be done in association with other works. Or Next one. We can do, in smaller areas, we can do gully treatments and grade control. So log brush, weirs, feed drops, they might not be appropriate here, although uh, you could probably have brush, use brush quite a, lit, quite a lot around here. Rock flumes, if you've got rock around the place. Um, there's also a three rock, three tree platen, which I'll go into in a sec. So one of the key things is we want to try and put water on water to dissipate the energy. So Tim was alluding to putting the little, uh, the plugs back into the, the system, which is effectively what that top diagram is showing the little triangles of the plugs, we create a little backwater effect and that toe of the backwater goes up to the toe of the next plug. So when water overflows in the second diagram, it's flowing onto water. And then you've got things like this, the three rock pattern or three trees, you can use whatever, to make, basically make water come back in on itself. And that produces a, a stagnant, a still zone or a stagnant zone behind the, the system. So that allows sediment to drop, reduces velocity, allows sediment to drop. That then allows regeneration of um, vegetation to grow as well. Next one. 
So one thing, I guess the main thing I was here to talk about a bit, um, and we were hoping to go out and look at one on the field, but it's not going to happen. But anyway, um, so one thing is contours. And it's a way of distributing the water, lengthening the flow path, um, and reducing the volume of water in the creek lines. So effectively we're reducing the volume in the creek lines, or the, water, the main waterways. So when we're going about doing landscape rehydration, we want to plan and as Tim was saying before, we want to do it as best as we possibly can initially so that we have fewer of the stuff ups down the track. So one thing is firstly, we need to understand the landholders' goals and their practices, what they're doing on the landscape. So we're working with the landholder. Um, we need to know the slope and the topography. How does the land look? Where are the natural steps? And this is where the natural, uh, the catch and function analysis comes in. We need to recognise the patterns in the landscape, again, the catch and function analysis. We want to start as high in the landscape as possible so that we can mac maximise the area of influence that we're trying to uh, rehydrate and to reduce the flows into and catch the runoff before it concentrates in the gullies. So again, distributing, redistributing that flow. Next one. So once you've come up with a plan, we need to do a bit of design work. Um, some of this you can do yourselves. So Google Earth Pro is a, you, something you can, everyone can access for free. Um, you can measure the catchment area. If you know your landscape, you can work out where the water sheds from. And you can determine the area. Um, you can determine the catchment outlet and centroid locations, so that just by eye. Um, this wasn't on before, was it? <laughs> anyway. Um, so just note when you're on Google Earth, and you'll see the next slide, that the negative value for latitude. Um, so you can see there, hopefully, this is the catchment we're working with um, just out here at Aleron. Um, we picked the centroid roughly with there and the outlet. And then we can plug that into the next one slide, the regional flood frequency estimation model, which is a web-based system plug the details down the left, the coordinates that you've picked up off Google Earth into that and put in the area. And this one is actually not from this because the system is not working at the moment for the Arrow region, but this is for somewhere in the Pilbara. Um, you get a, an output which shows the flow for different percentages of um, or time. So 50% of the time you'll get a flow at that level, about a one in this case. And one, one in a hundred years will be up here, so about uh, 10. So that particular catchment, I picked a catchment which is roughly the same size as the one just out here. Go to the next slide. And that's just the figures in the numbers. Um, so I've just circled the discharge that you'd be looking at for that, or roughly for that catchment, but it wouldn't be for that one, I think it'd be a bit less, but anyway. Next one. Um, and that's just it. some other factors that shows up um, just in terms of the other the flows, measured flows that it uses. So from that site, that's used those catchments that are actually measured. So it's actually using measured data to infer the flow at your site. So the reason why you do this is because one of the critical things is where you're spilling water, you need to do it safely. So you want to make sure that you've got the width to, to spread that flow so that the velocity is low where it comes out. And that's where that um, chart on the right is. So for that particular instance, we had 10 metres cubed per second. And your slope, so whatever your slope is, so if it's only a slow slope, you'd need 13 metres width of spill. And that applies to contour pond sills uh, and also spillways and also your overflow weirs. So the other thing we want to do is we want to try and trap some water from, the, from a rainfall event. We might sort of look at, say, okay, what's the rainfall we get almost every year, every year or close to every year? Around here it's about 30 millimetres. Um, and then you're trying to capture that volume. So in a contour bank, um, so, so basically you just factor your rainfall by the amount of runoff. Um, Mostly that, that runoff percentage is you're, you're going to know yourself if you get a 35 mil event 
how much runoff are you going to get? Is it going to be sort of 25%, 20%, 50%, whatever it is? So in the case here, we've got a runoff in that catchment of about 3,500 cubic metres in a 32, I think it was 31 mil event. Next one. And then you look at the whatever works you're doing. So in this case, we might be doing, say, a contour bank. Um, and you can work out the volume stored by that contour bank. And if you add all those contour banks that you're doing in the system, you want to try and match the volume that's stored to that event that you've just worked out. The constraint to your contour banks is your depth, because you want to be above the clay, because you want the system to leak. You need the water to be infiltrating. We want it to infiltrate, we don't want it flowing over land. So um, one constraint would be depth, and the constraint to your width and your, the batter slope of your banks is the, the slope of the land. So the steeper the slope, obviously you're more constrained on how much width you've got, otherwise you're going to have a massive great big structure. In small catchments and small areas, or we're only looking to harvest small amounts of water, we can look at a V-drain, or no, not a V-drain, sorry, a V-contour, V-shape, coal. <laughs> um, so we look at a V-shape, but these are on a contour, so they're actually not flowing large amounts of water, they're not flowing at high velocities. If we need to um, store a larger percentage of water, um, or we're in heavier soils and we need a bigger infiltration surface because that infiltration rate is low, we might go to a, a, a flat-based contour. So just terms and contours, um, so we're looking at the water flow coming in at a particular point and we run a bank around on the contour so it's the, the, uh, where it intersects the surface is completely level, there's no slope on it whatsoever. So when we're in a small to medium event, the water comes into the bank, flows along the bank, just driven by the, the head of water itself on the, in the bank, and then hopefully just soaks in through the soil. If there's a slightly more, it'll overflow at outlet sills, which you put at the ridge, so the water actually spreads out. So it actually flows out and it's not concentrated. We might create little mini wet, wetlands, ponds at those outlets. So in a larger flow, we don't want all the water rushing down these banks because they're just going to rush them out, push them out. So we have a sill at that waterway point, so it might be set a little bit higher than the other sills. So when the bigger flow comes over, it goes over the top, but it's, the volume is reduced and some water still goes down the sides, down the contours. We want to try and keep the spoil bank relatively level, so if it does get high water level in there, it'll overflow at once not in little spots. As soon as you get a spot flow, that's when it concentrates and erodes out. But effectively, the depth of our bank is to the natural surfaces, not on the spoil bank. One critical thing to, to be aware of when you're putting in contour bags or any works, really, is where the water's flowing out, we want to have absolutely minimal disturbance as possible. So you can see on this image, They've cut, that's the overflow sill there, and you can see there's still grass growing, and they haven't used, the machinery has not travelled on that section at all. So it's still grassed up, so when the water flows out, it's going to trickle over, it's not going to rush over. And the other critical thing is to make sure it's level. Just a couple of slides on just basic construction method for a simple V section contour. So your first pass, you do an initial cut, push up the initial spoil. Next one. You'll come back, um, particularly if you want to do a double contour, and this works. So you're cutting the other side, putting a spoil back onto the spoil bank, and that lower cut can be used to put in uh, mulches, any kind of material, organic matter, which the water will filter through and actually provide fertility to the land behind, down below it. Third one. Uh, so the next one, you cutting out the, the top batter, so making it flatter so when water runs into it, it's only on a lower slope. And the fourth pass is, the next one, just pushing that back up on the spoil bank. So that's pretty simple. Obviously things gonna, there's always gonna be something that throws you out, rocks, anything like that. Hard terrain where you might need to rip, so you might need a few extra passes, but that's your basics. Next one. So your completed profile, I'll just go back to that one. 
you can see the red dashed line there and the red mark there. So that's marking the intersection of where you've cut with the natural surface and that's your design water level. So that point there is where you're designing your storage, not there. Next one. Can't remember why I put that slide in there, but it's a pretty picture, so. <laughs> but you can use, um, so that's a fairly major structure, so we've used a graded grader. So. Um, you could also use particularly smaller structures. You can use an excavator. And in a way, an excavator is a good way, good tool, because as you can see, there's a nice undisturbed edge there, so there's still grass on the natural slope, and you can do that on the sill as well. Um, the advantage of the grader is that you can do a long run and that's it. Thank you.